Good evening. I'd like to welcome everybody to the January 17, 2023 meeting of the Board of Trustees, Smith Vocational Agricultural High School. May we please all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. To the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Um, I ask for roll call, please. Mr. Taylor? Present. Dr. Spencer Robinson? Present. Mr. Quadro? Present. Mayor Ciara might be late. <coughs> she hasn't canceled, and then Dr. Pearson Kim will not be here today. Thank you. Rick, can you do mission statement? Mission statement. Smith Vocational Agricultural High School is to prepare students for social responsibility, employment, and post-secondary education through rigorous applied technical and academic programs. Thank you. Is there any participation by the public today? Okay. Hello, my name is Jacob Furtaw and I'm in the shop of CJ Criminal Justice. I have an idea that I would like to present to all of you today. So I was going through the old yearbooks. Um, looking for my grandpa who graduated here back in 1965. I found him in the yearbooks. So after that, I was thinking, hmm, wonder what else I could look for. I was looking at the athletics part of it, and I was looking through all the old athletics um, pictures and history within the yearbooks, and I came up with this idea. I was thinking of a Smith Vocational throwback sports event. So. Let me give you a little backstory beforehand. I was doing a lot of research and for I did from research from the years 1939, 1943 through to 71. So from 1939, we were known as the Smiths or Smithsters at that point. Flash forward 1943, because there was no record of anything in between that. The athletics were only referred to as Smith School. And from 1955 through 59, we were just referred to as Smith. From 1960 through 65, we were referred to as the mechanics. And from 1966 through 1970, we were known as the tradesmen. In 1971 to present, we were the, all are the Vikings. This may not be 100% accurate. This is based on what I've found on the yearbooks. So, this is a plan that I've had. So. We will host a flashback sports game or a throwback, if possible. Um, a possible ways that we can do this is maybe with throwback jerseys, although that does cost a bit of money. So, but I was also planning, with closely working with the alumni association, if possible, to like have a banquet or have like an honor roll based on their achievements back in those times. So we can do, I can do more research in the yearbooks, get gather alumni um, records, or like what's that word? Like ask alumni around as well. So, also, why would this be a great idea? Well, first I'll bring Smith Folk alumni back to the game and reconnect with each other. Um, also, I was doing some more research on like throwback uniforms and, and other sports. Um, industries or events. The NFL has been doing them. You've probably seen this in the news multiple times. Um, it's getting a lot of positive publicity and good overall public outlook. It could possibly send a trend around this area too because I don't see too many high school teams doing the same thing. As well as 13 NFL teams have taken up a, a trend. I'm not saying this will be this for football. I'm saying this can be any sport within the school and at your choosing, of course. So, hope you take it into consideration, as Mr. Bianco said, he'll take it into consideration. 
help. I just want to share the idea as well as you. So thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Good job on your research. So um, do we have any participation by the trustees tonight? Jane, I attended the MASC Learning Lunch on State Accountability last Friday and want to share three brief points with the board. Um, one is that the federal government requires states to meet certain student achievement goals, and to be accountable for that, states have to identify their lowest performing 5% of schools. Massachusetts state law also requires identification of the lowest performing 20% of schools. There was a waiver on that during the pandemic. Second, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education assigns its high school percentile rate ranks based on two years of this data, MCAS scores, graduation and dropout rates, chronic absenteeism, progress of English language learners, and percent of 11th to 12th graders taking an advanced course. And third, these percentile ranks will be used by DESE to determine how long each school has to get student MCAS scores back to where they were in 2019. Since there was so much variance in student learning loss, they want to offer a tailored approach for schools to meet their full recovery targets. Those with the largest decline in MCAS scores will have the longest time to recover. Smith Vocational is in the third quartile, so we have three years. I saw Dr. Lincoln Holker nod or some, nodding, so I'm assuming I got all that right. Good, all right? Um, and I would like to um, forward to us a request from our school business manager who asked that we um, recognize Joe Cook, who is the City what, procurement. procurement officer, and he's retiring after a long career and has been uh, provided great service to us at Smith Vocational. Um, so, on behalf of Ms. Fairman, could we recognize him at our next meeting and give him a certificate of appreciation? For the You're making that a yeah. motion? I don't think I can in an announcement. Or do we have to? I don't think so. No, I think we can just announce that we'd like to do it. Okay. And we'll consider it for next meeting. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Rick, um, No, not at this time. Okay. <clears throat> they have a motion and a second to approve the minutes of the December 20th Board of Trustees meeting. So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. School stop, uh, see here, spotlight, <laughs> stoplight. We can have, uh, Mr. Bianca has a brief presentation uh, up on the smart board behind us. Just to overview and, and summarize all of the grants that we've been receiving, specifically the last three big grants that we have. Uh, I, I know a lot of our time has been focused on facility upgrades that are a function of the grants, uh, but we thought it would be beneficial for the board to see, besides the potential renovation to the space, what equipment are we actually purchasing? Uh, so, Joe, sure. Go <coughs> So our vocational director helped me prepare this presentation, so I want to thank uh, Melanie Chartier. As you can see here, the, you see the dollar amounts that we received uh, in the June, September, and the, light, the latest one, the December grant, uh, and which programs those are targeting. Uh, so you'll see culinary arts, animal science, horticulture, horticulture, ag med, cabinet making, and advanced manufacturing. Um, so we're targeting six programs out of these grants. Previously, we targeted um, so if you look at those six, we targeted electrical, we targeted <clears throat> machine previously, um, we did health assisting. Uh, so there's been a lot of spreading, uh, you know, we talk about nine out of 15 programs over probably the last five years have been targeted for improvements. <clears throat> so the one that we got for culinary arts this is uh, a quick overview of, of everything that the, the major purchases, there's other smaller purchases. These are the major purposes, uh, purchases that we're doing. So the fire suppression Ansel hood system, obviously that's something that we've known here has been an issue for a long time. Um, in fact, there's been times when we've had the fire department arrive uh, here. So that, that's finally going to be uh, brand new and, and built back up. The walk-in fridge freezers, that's something that we've been tracking and trying to find money to be able to do since we came here, so nine years. And I know, Tim, you guys have been focused on it longer. Um, some of the things that we're also adding in, hands-free sinks, on the, when you look at particular 
things like the rotary oven, steam kettle, tilt skillet, these are things that are in industry, so the our students are going to be able to learn on uh, that industry standard equipment that is found in commercial kitchens. Food truck is a huge purchase. I know we've talked about it here, but that's going to allow our students, when you think about uh, culinary arts, <clears throat> most of our programs on campus have a pathway to entrepreneurship pretty quickly. Uh, if you know anything about the restaurant business, it's very hard to break into. Um, you know, Chef Lacey has told me that they make about a 4% margin, and the majority of restaurants, 50% or so, fail within the first year or two. But if you're paying attention to trends, food trucks is a much lower uh, cost to get into, lower overhead, and people are, are able to get into that entrepreneurship of, of restaurant ownership through food trucks. We think this is a great avenue for our students uh, to be able to see that and, and potentially uh, for them to start their own businesses sooner. Uh, and, and we had, a, over break, we had the restaurant floor done, uh, which it looks beautiful in that picture. If you haven't been over there, it's amazing. Um, and we're going to be doing an outdoor patio, which is part of the uh, sidewalk project that we have planned for around A building. That's something that, that Tim is overseeing. <clears throat> and finally, a POS system, so that's your point of sale. And that's going to be an integrated point of sale system with the front and the uh, back of the kitchen so that they're seeing that stuff come through, just like in a modern day restaurants. Sure. Um, overall, these purchases are about safety, they're about deepening the experience for the students, having them on that, that uh, industry standard equipment. Any, any questions on that? Grant, I think I could take them one at a time. It's exciting. Yeah, it really Especially is. with the hood. Make the kitchen breathable. Yeah. Uh, in the lab modernization grant, this was the September grant, so this was the animal science and this was horticulture. Um, this is all part of what we talk about at the uh, property subcommittee, so we're talking about phases of renovation here. Um, and the first phase is that we're renovating the former GCC building down back, which is going to create office, locker room, classrooms for student use. Uh, which will take all of them out of that, that MS bar and classroom and out of what has become almost a permanent, like permanent classroom when we started as a temporary classroom uh, three years ago. <clears throat> It'll be nice when we can finally move the students out. They're going to be in that in the proper classrooms. Um, additionally, the grant is going to support outfitting all those classrooms. So that's the desk, the smart boards, uh, all the equipment that you would, you would see inside that classroom. Phase two. Uh, is then that nursery barn that was vacated is going to be demoed and is going to get turned into that dog, groom, dog grooming kenneling facility. Uh, we're also going to be going into what was the MS Park classroom. That's going to become Pocket Pets Kenneling Lab. So that, all that work will be done. And again, part of that grant is all of the equipment and implementation that we're going to need to get that companion animal concentration in. Also part of that grant was uh, horticulture. So there's some really exciting things in this. And um, it's kind of one of those things where it's sad that, that we had the fire, obviously. Um, but we're, I think everybody is really focused on trying to look at it as an opportunity to really improve. And this first series of grant, this first grant in the series, is really going to help us because one of the big things that we're going to be getting um, are the simulator trainers for heavy machinery. Uh, we're going to be getting four of those and we're going to be getting a teacher station where they can oversee it and these all link together so one student can be on a backhoe, another one on a bulldozer, another one on the dump truck and they can be working in tandem, they can be working as a unison on, as if they were actually on a site. We would never actually put multiple pieces of equipment together because our students don't reach that, that expertise while they're here. Um, but this is going to get them to really do it. All the controls are lifelike. The seat, everything is going to be just like they're driving it. So this will become part of a two-phase approach that will give students that basic knowledge before they actually get into one. Uh, but then also later on that, that uh, advanced experience of working in tandem with each other. <clears throat> Some real equipment that we're going to be getting. Dump truck, the compact excavator, backhoe, the track and wheel skid steers, which we've already received, and brush chipper. Uh, all of our heavy machinery is very, very old. Uh, so this is going to really allow us to upgrade all that heavy machinery that we have on campus. And uh, not just for our students, but it's also used by farm staff for a lot of the uh, chat tasks and chores that we have to be doing around. So have, it's really going to help us function. Have um, students had, <clears throat> uh, do you know if any students have had a chance to use the simulators? 
No, they're not going to get. They will be installed when the new building's built. Has anybody on our staff had a chance to use them? Um, I don't know if they've used that particular simulator. I'd have to ask Mark. But when we've gone to different uh, trade shows or some of the uh, conferences that we've been at, they're all set up. So there's there's multiple different ones that they have played with. I don't know if they've actually used that exact simulator. And then, That's the one that was recommended yeah. uh, through their organization and through the, actually through the state foresters. I think it was through the state foresters. Obviously, it's a yeah. simulator, but I'm wondering how much it's like oh, an actual piece of equipment versus how it's different. Yeah. So. The, what we're told by uh, the people who recommended it, it's exact. So all that, all the specifications, where you're sitting, where the controls are, it's a replica of sitting inside of the machine. Yep. <coughs> and then in the December grant, obviously we had that three and a half million dollars for that new construction, um, and that includes tables, chairs, smart boards for the classrooms. Uh, we also got, we'll be getting battery powered chainsaws and landscaping tools, and we're getting utility tractors, leaf backs, grooming mowers, scag walk behind, irrigation pipe pullers so the students can start actually putting in irrigation systems, uh, which is another part of the, the program that they weren't uh, getting regular access to. Um, and some of this other stuff like brush mower, log splitter, that's things we lost in the fire. On the ag mech side, um, we're looking to, to really improve that ventilation and expand the amount of welding machines that we can have operating that have proper ventilation. A lot of times we open the door and they're put outside, um, and, then, and not so many are, are actually within that ventilation system, so we're using just natural air to ventilate. But this will allow us to have that more, um, more of that experience inside. Uh, the other big thing that they're going to be adding is a virtual welder, which we do have one in um, collision repair. This is similar. This one is a little bit more robust. And really that's so, again, students can work on pace, uh, the distance that you are from it. It'll be able to read that intensity uh, and to know if you're actually making a good weld and if you're pulling off the basics. Of course, at the end of the day, just like with the other simulators, you actually have to get on the equipment to, to, get the, to really get good at it. Um, another one, diesel training engine. So, a lot of things right now in AgMEC, they're taking apart engines that we have um, and other things. They'll try to reassemble them, but they're not working engines. So this is going to allow us <clears throat> to be able to rebuild those engines and then test them. So it's one, one part that, that we've been lacking is to be able to get them back together and make sure that we put them back together the right way and test them. Hydraulic simulators, obviously that's in any kind of hoisting equipment uh, and the tractors that we use and things. So again, this is part of the frameworks. This is a deeper dive for them. It comes with curriculum and lessons. Um, so there, that's, that's going to be a really good thing for them. So here's just what it looks like. So this is the ventilation systems that we're getting, some of the welders. Um, this is the simulation trainers for the hydraulics. In cabinet making, which was targeted in this grant, uh, one of the things we're going to get is the 4x4 Lugina Swift CNC machine, and that is uh, a 4 foot by 4 foot machine. So we can actually put panels in there. So if you see, like over there, we're on the, the cabinet that they made, uh, instead of hand robbering that stuff, they're going to be able to program the CNC machine just like the, the mill machines that are in advanced manufacturing, and they'll be able to make panels, molding. Uh, all those kinds of things. It's really, really a neat, neat piece of equipment. They can also make any kind of your, you see those signs that actually have the lettering cut into them. So this machine, the students will learn how to program it and run it and then produce those things. Um, another thing that's a big is the laser engraver. Um, this, this down below is actually, that's the, the CNC mill. Down below is the laser engraver. Um, and again, that's going to be able to, using that laser, engrave intricate um, pictures or other things right into wood for the students to use. And finally, we're getting two of these dust collection systems. These are mobile systems. We have a system up there, but of course, cabinet shops get dirty and dusty. Uh, this is going to help increase it be, uh, by uh, attaching it to specific machines and areas. Advanced manufacturing, we're always looking to improve. That's always changing. One of the things that we want to do is right now we have 
the, the biggest we have is a four axis machine is now we're going to be moving to a five axis machine which obviously lets us move in a lot a lot more uh, directions in space and we can become more complex with what the students are producing new 3d printer that they're going to be using uh, fiber marking laser and um, all that stuff this is all industry standard things it's one of the hardest shops to stay up to date on um, and then we're, we're increasing by replacing all these mills that you have to do you always have to upgrade certain pieces of equipment and then there's new software that our instructors want to get um, that'll really be able to help the students design more so they're going to get more on that design side of the projects but and then be able to produce it in the five axis mill <coughs> so pending any questions that's the spotlight right now on what those programs will be uh, adding to their shop areas <coughs> thank you George. I, I only want to say that, and um, what's the ideal time for getting information about all of this equipment out to the public, and can we issue a press release and get it on our website and possibly include it in your newsletter? Uh, I mean, any family learning about this is going to be so impressed. Right? Well, one thing about in the open house, and, and people are touring the campus. Yeah. When you have this, I mean, it's just going to take care of a lot of uh, have to explain things. They're going to go wow. Well. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Anything else? All set? Yeah, very cool. Okay. Uh, Andy? <coughs> I just probably something in the Okay. Rick, you got an update? Um, sure, property subcommittee. We met today at 3 o'clock. First part of the meeting was regarding building E, the horticulture building. Excuse me. Uh, what, with our, uh, our feasibility study architect, uh, Kevin Reardon from Dietz Architects. We've uh, come to conclusion on that part of our process. And now we're looking forward to uh, moving forward to getting this out to uh, hiring an OPM, uh, Owner's Project Manager, and that's required by state procurements by the MSBA due to the size of the project. And with bringing that OPM on board helped with the process of uh, hiring a design team, an architectural firm to put the project together. Um, we're not able to move directly forward with our feasibility study architectural firm of Deeps Architects. Uh, it still has to go out to competitive process, and that will start tomorrow, basically. Uh, Crystal's already emailed Joe Cook from the city procurement officer, and uh, we do have some concerns um, with that process due to the fact that Joe's last day is February 20th or something like that. Um, so we'd like to get this all in order before he leaves. Um, so we went through a lot of scenarios of what we would like to do, what we can afford. And uh, right now we have about, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Handy, um, about 5.8 million in funds to move forward. Leaves us about 800 thousand short of what we'd like to do or essentially do but there's even oh, a bigger wish list beyond that if things work and we find more money because we'd love to be able to uh, really move to the future with this project um, for the students and for the campus and put a real stamp on our program um, that was the first part of our meeting then uh, we shifted gears <coughs> into uh, all the things we have going on on campus and off campus. The school uh, stewards of a bit of land. They have the forestry property building up in Leeds by the VA hospital, which we're attempting to uh, bring into more utilization. So we're working on that. We got the farm out on Burt's Pit Road with Tim and his crew working on updating the <coughs> facilities there. 
uh, the paddock, apple storage, floor repair um, has been rebid, and I believe uh, we've accepted a, a low bid for the structural repairs. There are two alternates involved, which we can't afford at this time. Um, a lot of moving parts on going on here. Uh, the city has a drainage issue at the Locust Street pasture that they approached us about, which will be they'll be moving forward with. Uh, one of our main focuses on campus is getting the the old rec building slash GCC building into shape to move the animal science classrooms into it, so we can start um, bringing that program into the next phase of its development in terms of getting into uh, companion animals and, and uh, grooming and things of that nature and frees up other space to be able to uh, renovate that's dovetailed into a number of other projects. Um, we got a lengthy list here. Uh, the window project started uh, over uh, Christmas vacation <coughs> at a building, correct? And that went smoothly. And uh, what's the next, uh, in April we're going to attack what temp? So February they'll do B building. February, I'm sorry. Yep, so they finished up sealing this building. So they're done in here. <coughs> they just have to supply us the screens for the windows at some point. Okay. So April you're moving into... I'm sorry. <laughs> so be building then April. Okay. Um, part of uh, the old whole animal science program is is uh, we're looking to demo the old pig barn and and reconstruct uh, build something new. We're looking to do essentially most of that in house. Uh, you got the air conditioning and building C going to be starting. Refresh my memory here. It's a summer job, but we're going to go out to bid. Hopefully, we can put it on the central register next week. <clears throat> okay, thank you. There we go. Got so many notes here. Mm -hmm. I keep track of all my stuff. Okay, um, also uh, this summer, and Principal Joe mentioned that it's tied in with a sidewalk project. We got funded through the uh, city capital improvement projects. Um, we have a sidewalk project, and along with that will be some patio work for the, uh, the Oliver Smith restaurant. And a number of miscellaneous things still going on during during the summer. Install some new LED <coughs> lighting, replace drop ceilings, paint walls, and apply epoxy flooring to the auto body shop. Before we do the epoxy flooring to the auto body shop, we'll have to uh, have the original floor removed by a abatement company due to the fact it contains asbestos. Um, and hopefully have the cafeteria painted this summer. Uh, anything else I might have missed? Jeff, Tim, do you have any comments? Um, on that, the city's plan to dump all that water into our field. We're supposed to meet with uh, city engineers and Ty and Bond on the 18th. Right. They're gonna put some monitoring stakes on the riverbank and they'll be there for two years to to check to make sure there's no erosion. Can you say that again? <coughs> okay. um, we're going to meet with the city engineers, yep. time bond engineering representatives, yep. and they're going to put some monitoring stakes on the Brook Bank uh, for two years to, to, ship, to watch for erosion. Okay. Yeah. And you're happy with that? 
I have no choice, so I, I am. <laughs> yeah, we, we push for that during this whole process. Right. There's concern about the scouring of the Brook Bank right. due to the fact of the way the water may infiltrate into our property. Um, I did attend the meeting with conservation. It was a Zoom meeting in regards to how they're going to mitigate the flow of water onto our property. And it's very well thought out. and. Um, Hopefully there won't be any issues, but we did, part of the process was we pushed for that this Brook Bank to be monitored. Um, I think that about wraps it up. Thank you for all that information. Thank you. Good evening. Just a few brief highlights from the, the, the previous month. Uh, back on December 21st, I attended uh, the MIA uh, TMC meeting. Uh, once again, that's the Tournament Management Committee. Uh, and I'll be off campus tomorrow for the most part attending uh, the first in-person meeting down in Franklin. So it'll be nice finally getting back in person and, and being down in the building. Uh, I've been down there in several years. And then, uh, as we know, we then celebrated some time off, the December break. We were gone for just over a week. We came back, and uh, I want to thank Mr. Bianca for uh, the co-leadership in getting the January newsletter out as soon as possible. Once we got back from vacation, we got that pushed out to, uh, to the community. I, I think we've got a lot of positive feedback, uh, some great input as far as getting the, the great information out there as well. And then on uh, January 4th, I had a meeting with some representatives from DESE around the non-resident tuition uh, process and procedures. I think this is a, a difficult topic every single year. As, as we know, we have approximately 80% of our students come from uh, non-resident communities, i.e. any town that's not Northampton. And uh, it's, it's a challenge. I know when we go on the road show, when we talk to select boards, uh, a lot of these small communities, uh, it's a big budget hit for them to send a child to Smith Vocational. They're looking at $18,600, give or take, along with transportation costs. So what happens is a lot of our students, uh, they come here freshman year to explore, uh, depending on the town that they live in, there are certain stipulations as far as what programs they can uh, get into, what programs they cannot get into. And through the exploratory process, sometimes students will choose a program that they really want, and then that requires some conversation with the city district, because the city district okayed that child to come here for a particular program, now they want a different program, and what happens. Uh, so. It's a, an endless dialogue between uh, my office uh, and their office. Uh, oftentimes we have parents who are appealing uh, a denial up to the department, and oftentimes we have sending districts appealing to the department saying, you know, do we have to send a child to some educational? So uh, these, these, these calls happen all the time. Um, as far as that, that January 4th meeting, I think it was very productive. I was able to share a lot of information as far as how we handle our counseling of the students and the families. I think the department is appreciative and, and, and respected that. Uh, is there a perfect solution? No, there's not. Uh, it basically, it's us and it's Minuteman down in Lexington. Uh, we are the two schools in the state that have a large percentage of non-resident students. I think we, by far, have the most. Uh, so this this model of non-resident tuition uh, is a great model statewide, but uh, it is how we basically operate as a school. But it's a difficult model uh, to, to try to follow, uh, especially when we have competing stakeholders. Uh, but anyhow, uh, on January 6th, I'll get into this uh, this phone call in more detail in, in another slide, but I had a phone call from Smith College and just talking about some funding options for the horticulture building. Uh, we'll deal, detail that more momentarily. One of the hot topics, and uh, I've sort of taken some mental notes uh, with Mr. Bianco was uh, discussing the grants, but there's an issue statewide with the hoisters license uh, requirements. <clears throat> and, uh, and this is Started at Keefe Tech uh, down in uh, Framingham. Uh, there was an indiv individual who came in and, in, in essence, uh, shut their horticulture program down uh, where the students cannot use any of the hoisting equipment. And uh, this started about two or three years ago, uh, and uh, it's sort of risen up through to the point now that Bob, we're taking this on. We've had phone calls with the Department of Ed. Uh, we now have the FFA involved, uh, and, and we're actually getting into some legislation. Uh, that we're proposing, and we'll again talk about uh, momentarily. I'm telling my, my colleagues in MAVA, <clears throat> we can talk about admissions policies, we can talk about different policies and procedures and regulations all day long, uh, but this voices license is a real issue 
that is, is going to impact a lot of us statewide. Uh, so when Joe is mentioning all this new equipment that we're getting, the excavator, the skid steers, the backhoe, uh, this is millions of dollars worth of equipment that the Department of Ed and the governor has signed off for, for vocational schools to have. And if the competing agency wins out, we're not going to be able to use this equipment. Uh, because in essence, what they're saying is, in order to use any of the hoisters equipment, you need to have a hoisters license. Well, to have a hoisters license, you have to be 18, you have to pass a DOT physical. Uh, so most of our students are not 18, and uh, to get access to a DOT physical is, is next to impossible. So this is a real fight that we're taking on. Uh, I'll talk more details momentarily. Uh, so Deeds Architects, uh, again, this is the architecture firm We're going through the feasibility study for the architecture, uh, the, the horticulture building. We had a follow-up meeting on January 9th where uh, Kevin kind of walked through and had several questions for us, really detailed questions. Uh, and I want to thank Tim for being part of this as well. I'm talking questions as far as how many outlets per wall, uh, how many sinks, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, the goal behind that, even though we're not in that design phase of the building, the goal of that particular meeting is to, was to get as much information as possible so that they can send all that information off to the estimator so that we could have a more accurate estimate cost of what that building is going to be. Uh, so again, I, I want to thank Kevin. Uh, it's been a very long process. Uh, he has, I think, gone above and beyond as far as the scope of the work that we agree to. Uh, I think what we're going to have uh, will set us up, hopefully, for a, a more smooth process. I'm not going to say it's a smooth process, but a more smooth process, uh, hiring the OPM and hiring the design firm. <clears throat> January 10th, we had our first. Uh, we being the, most of the admin, uh, we are participating in some mindfulness workshop uh, work. The concept is, uh, we all know we, we want to have uh, an equity audit. We really want to focus on equity uh, school-wide. And that is the what. What do we want to do is the equity focus. Uh, the mindfulness is the how. How are we going to accomplish this task? And it's really focusing on us uh, as administrators, as individuals, trying to process how do we think, how do we perceive. Uh, so on January 10th, that was our kickoff, really talking about what is the definition of mindfulness, uh, so some of the big themes. I thought it was a great uh, first hour. Uh, we had a second hour today, which we'll talk about momentarily. Then uh, that same evening, I had the opportunity, I was invited to present, uh, be a co-presenter at the Western Mass Council Association. They had a meeting uh, down in Connecticut uh, to talk about the relationship between school counselors and administrators. You know, what does that positive relationship look like? And if you have that positive relationship, uh, what does it mean for, the, for your student body and for your school? I'll show you a picture of the, the presenters momentarily. <coughs> Last week, I think it was last Thursday, I went down to Old Colony, our uh, regional broke tech, they're down in Rochester, uh, Mass, uh, just prior to getting to the Cape. And uh, I was able to meet with the superintendent down there, along with uh, one of the associate commissioners from the, de uh, the department, just to talk about a lot of the statewide issues that we're, feeling, uh, that we're dealing with. It was also nice to take a tour of Old Colony. They're actually in the midst of an MSBA project, or at least they're, they're hoping for an M MSBA project. And to see their facilities and compare their facilities to our facilities, uh, I'm actually quite happy being here, to be honest. Uh, they have an old building. It's a single building. It's, it's newer than what we have here. Um, but as far as the space that we have, I walked into a lot of shops, and they're very small. The square footage-wise, extremely small, extremely cramped, old, dirty. Uh, so I want to thank Tim and his crew. Uh, it's sort of this double-edged sword. We keep talking about we, we need more facilities, new facilities, upgraded facilities. But we do such a great job maintaining what we have. Uh, if, you, uh, if you're outside of looking in, some people may honestly say, well, why do you need something new when we have what we have? Um, so take it for what it's worth. But anyways, it was a great experience being down there last week. We had a long weekend uh, celebrating Martin Luther King on uh, Junior's Day uh, yesterday. This morning we had our second session on mindfulness. The main focus this morning was around conception and stress. And, uh, and one of my mottos is, Back in school counseling days, uh, perception is reality. And sometimes you can't change somebody's perception. That is their reality. And, and how do we then interact with somebody if they have a different perception than us? Uh, but then how our perception, which, which might be different than the person next to you, we might be perceiving something differently, how does that then cause stress in your life? And as administrators, how do we then cope with that and deal with that? So I, I thought it was a great second session. Um, and then, as Mr. Ricard just said, we had our most recent properties of community meeting. <coughs> Um, so the first one is about the non-resident tuition yes. procedures. Do we track um, the sending districts that appeal 
the student placement as a family request, and do we track the shops that are that the students want to stay in that the district doesn't authorize? Do we keep track of that information? And if not, could we do that going forward? Yeah, we no, we keep track of that information because guidance has to get involved in trying to get new tuition forms, uh, and then what the outcome is. So yeah, we can identify. Great. I would love to be able to see that just to sort of. <coughs> Um, you know. Yeah, yeah, just to see if there are any patterns mm -hmm. or any trends. Um, my second question is about um, which shops are affected by the Hoister's license? Another double-edged sword. Right now, the issue revolves around horticulture, and specifically us as an Aggie, we have <coughs> animal science, potentially. Okay. Ag back to an extent as well. Um, it was my son in culinary arts. I know that he had special dispensation to do things that other young people his age couldn't do that was prevented by the state. How, why does not that apply in this case? There's a different state agency who oversees the, the issuing of the hoisting license. And they are arguing student safety. And they don't really worry or care about Chapter 74 regulations. What's the agency? Our Office of Professional Licensure. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Would it be public safety also? Yeah. What's that? Uh, public safety. I don't think they're involved in this. Not yet. Yeah. I think Desi Safety Officer approves of it. And my last question is um, the Desi conversation. What was that about? Did I miss that? That whole call? Uh, um, hoisting was one of them. Yeah. Um, Admissions policies, an update on, uh, right now there are five schools uh, that the department has identified with some concerns around uh, their demographic data. Uh, so we talked about that. Uh, access, or lack thereof. What can we do to try to get better access to the middle schools? What would that look like? So, great discussions about it. Thank you. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> I know it's difficult to see from the peanut gallery, but uh, this is right now the updated sort of conceptual drawing of the new horticulture building. The big shift, um, again, if you're sort of the, a bird flying over the, the current building or, or what's remaining of the building, the big change is this little rectangle is the greenhouse. Okay, we're hoping to save the greenhouse. But right now the greenhouse is sort of swung over here. Okay, uh, the new design is going to bring it around. The current storage bar that we have adjacent to the, uh, the horticulture building. Right now, the recommendation is that storage barn comes down, and in essence, that greenhouse is going to be very close to where that, that current barn is, just to give you an orientation. Uh, B building is sort of up here. The football field is right there. Uh, this potential design, uh, if again, through this entire process, if it comes to fruition, uh, gives us three actual classrooms, uh, which is more than what we currently have down there. It gives us sort of two working garage uh, project area. Uh, Obviously, having to multitask, and again, when we started back in July, uh, what Kevin calls a program of studies is basically uh, a schedule. Uh, it's basically an Excel spreadsheet, and it has every single working space that we were asking for. Uh, through that process, we couldn't have dedicated space with every single task. We had to sort of multi-purpose as much as possible. As one example, this project space here, and what do, you, what do we mean by project space? Well, currently, the garage that is still remaining is a garage. We can store things in there. Uh, but oftentimes, uh, the students would, would be building some hardscapes, okay, practicing laying rock and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so that can continue in this space. But also, one of the grants, barely see it, but there would be an indoor climbing facility. Uh, so the students can learn how to climb and use that apparatus without being outside in the snow and the rain and the wind, climbing trees. They can be climbing inside on, on that particular apparatus. So we have to combine all of that space. Thank you to Joe showing that, that lovely simulator that we're buying. Okay, we're buying four of those actually. We will have a dedicated, so in essence, a fourth classroom, uh, but a space dedicated for the four simulators. Uh, so that way we can kind of keep it clean, keep it organized, uh, and it's not interfering with the three traditional classrooms. The head house, uh, we had to sort of downscale again over the, the last several months. We couldn't have what we really were asking for originally. Uh, but that head house would still provide retail space. Uh, so when we have the greenhouse up, uh, up and running and we want to be selling some, some salad greens to the staff or to the community, uh, we have access to a retail space 
but also in project space. So when the students are making the reads uh, and other indoor projects, uh, they also have that space. So uh, at the end of the day, I am very pleased with the process. Uh, I'm trying to tell people I know this is smaller than what we were envisioning back in July, but again, pre-fire, we were not thinking, we being in the board, uh, for myself, I was not thinking about rebuilding the horticulture building anytime soon. We were focused on animal science, focusing on how to increase uh, the animal science offerings into all the concentrations, and then something awful happened in, in late May. Uh, but through that process, through the grants that Joe and Melanie have written for, again, over four million dollars we can apply from the grants to this building. Uh, we have about 5.8 million available, over four million simply from grants. So without the grants, I said this earlier today, I'll say it again, uh, without that four plus million dollars from the grants, I don't think we're talking about a potential new building. We're simply talking about how do we rebuild the actual fire piece and save everything else. Uh, so if this all goes well, it's still going to be very tight, but there's a potential that we walk away with a new building, not the Taj Mahal, but a new building for our students that will house 21st century equipment that we didn't pay for out of our own pocket, came from grants, um, and very little impact on, on the city as far as finances and no impact from the setting districts. I think that is a major, major win for us. Um, so, uh, mindfulness, again, this is sort of our um, front burner for the, the admin. Uh, this was the, the, the definition that we were working with. These were the presenters last week. Uh, Myself and, and two of my former colleagues uh, from Lenson, they are now uh, current administrators in other high schools. We have the current executive director from the MIA, he is the former superintendent, and then a new staff person from uh, the MIA. Uh, that was the panel talking about uh, the relationship between councils and our students. It was a great night. And then on the far right, um, I, I sort of joked on Facebook, you know you, you know you made it in life. When they name a, a menu item on the, on the menu after you, so I thought this was a really cool idea. I, I want to steal it. But um, when you go to Old Colony, make sure you get the big Lincoln Hook for breakfast. Okay? It was delicious. Okay? Um, what's, what's in it? Two eggs. Two eggs, <laughs> cookie liking, two pancakes, home fries, and sausage or bacon. Okay? Um, or you could have had the Eggs Bennett, uh, which is two eggs any style. And that was in honor of Liz Bennett, the associate commissioner. That was it. Uh, so, anyways, right. I made the menu. I've already talked about this. Uh, the mindfulness work, we have eight sessions planned. We've done two already. And uh, in essence, I want to thank Joe uh, for dedicating. Uh, he has two BAP meetings a week. Uh, in essence, the, the same le leaders that are part of that BAP meeting, uh, rather than finding another day to try to get everybody together, uh, we are supporting the, uh, the building administrative team. So, one of the, the middle management. Um, the ones who really truly run the school. And uh, so their Tuesday morning meeting is what we're dedicating to the mindfulness work. And uh, again, as I already mentioned, this will prepare us for the equity work uh, that's coming up with Sydney Weeks Bradley. A lot of this we've already talked about. Uh, this is the horticulture building, just big picture update. Uh, right now we're about that 5.5, I thought, uh, I, I think that I found the building before this, this afternoon's meeting was going to be in that five and a half million range. Uh, the current uh, estimate, this is before the estimator came back, all things included, we're talking site work and, and everything else, the OPM fee, everything rolled in, probably closer to 6.8 million. Uh, so as, as Rick said earlier, probably looking at best case scenario about $800,000 short. Uh, so we're close. Okay? Uh, but again, I've already mentioned this. If this works out, it's a minimal impact on Northampton and ascending communities. It's providing a 21st century learning opportunity for the students. And uh, this wasn't an option uh, before May. So, uh, yes, I've lost a lot of sleep, uh, a lot of stress. But when we, when we look at the benefit and the potential positive of walking away from this, I think it will be, will be okay. So back to that letter. Uh, so back on December 5th, this was sort of a product of the Smith College community breakfast that you two went to, uh, the, the president, President McCartney, just asked for like an update. So, so what is happening at the campus as far as this fire? So I, I sent a letter to her back on December 5th, talked about the fire, talked about the loss, talked about uh, the potential cost of the building, 
talked about the current uh, revenue sources that we have to rebuild the project, uh, to rebuild the building, talking about how short we are. So then on uh, uh, January 6th, I had a phone call uh, from David Diswork. He is the school, the college's finance director. And uh, he said, I was given this letter. I was asked to call you. So we had a great conversation. Uh, he's obviously very knowledgeable when it comes to finances. He is obviously very knowledgeable with building projects. You know what's happening down at their campus with building projects. So back and forth for a solid hour. And at the end of the conversation, he asked me, so what am I asking for? You know, what is the big ask? I said, a million dollars. Uh, and he didn't laugh. Uh, so he said, sounds good. He was going to go talk to his people and see what they can do. And we'll be in touch. Uh, so I shared that with the board. Uh, thank you for the, the connections. Uh, I think it's an obvious relationship between the two Smiths uh, in the city. Uh, so we'll see. I'm not counting on it. That would be bonus money back to if we had more money, what can we do? It would be lovely. Uh, so just giving the board an update on, on that conversation. So next steps. We've already talked about this. Um, Crystal already started this process before she left this evening uh, and, and reached out to Joe Cook. Uh, we need to hire a, uh, a project manager as soon as possible. And then that will help us with the future steps, which is to go out to bid for the design uh, phase. And uh, this is more good news. Uh, we talked about the economic bond bill that sort of got held up at the state level uh, last summer. And uh, we all thought it sort of just dried up and it wasn't an option. Well, it was approved by the state. It was signed by the governor. And our specific amendment that Senator Comerford put through is still out there. Uh, so I received a notification right before Christmas break. I had to fill out this form. Crystal and I filled it out. We sent it off to our state contact that was assigned to us. So they are going through those amendments and, and working on allocating that, that money. Um, so that's some more good news. <clears throat> so rather than trying to put things on the smart board, I thought a little show and tell. So I believe in your packets or your supplemental packets that thank you to Deb handing out. There's three documents I just want to some briefly cover, more some maybe go into more detail. The first one is the MAAC, MASS letter of support, which I know you have an official agenda item later this <coughs> week. Uh, I just wanted to, to highlight the letter. Uh, it's dated January 4th. It was addressed to the governor-elect, now the governor. And this is a, a letter that's signed by uh, Tom Scott, who is the, the executive director of MASS, that's the School Superintendents Association, signed by Glenn Kucher, the executive director of your association, the School Committee Association, uh, and then uh, both presidents of the, of the two teacher unions uh, that represent teachers in the state, uh, the MTA and uh, AFT. So in essence, what those individuals and those associations are advocating for is that the new governor looks at the uh, funding formula, the Chapter 70, which is the public funding uh, source. Again, we have a very small percentage of our budget is Chapter 70. Ours is typically mostly the, the non-resident tuition. But, what they're pushing for is the new administration to look at the funding and, in essence, uh, apply the actual inflation increase rather than sort of a calculated inflation increase. The bottom of the first page, just to give you some very black and white numbers in front of you to see the impact of what they're asking for, just saying, by our calculations, capping the inflation factor of 4.5% in FY24, when added to the losses from the inflation cap, uh, cap in FY23, <coughs> would reduce Chapter 78 by about 445 million. That's the current model, okay? So they're asking uh, the new governor to sort of override that and apply the actual inflation. Uh, so that's the letter, you have it, you can talk about it on your agenda item later. The next one I just wanted to share with the board, uh, this is the Mass CTE, formerly known as MVA. Uh, the Friend of CTE nomination. So to give you some context, uh, so MVA is sort of a, a sister association of MAVA. Uh, <coughs> supports is more uh, teacher supported and the MAVA is more the administrative support. MVA puts on an annual conference. Uh, they haven't had it over the last couple of years because of the pandemic, uh, but they have it down at Patriot Place. <clears throat> Before the pandemic, uh, we as a school have been attending uh, and we've had great success. Uh, one is uh, they always ask each school to provide a donation of some type of student-built uh, project. And uh, there's a, a big raffle, a big competition, and uh, we are always sort of the, the team to beat. Uh, thank you to, to Scott Miller and the Cap and Bacon program. They do excellent work. Uh, 
On top of that, there's professional development at the conference. On top of that, they have an award ceremony uh, in the evening. They give various student awards, uh, sort of a secondary uh, ed student. Uh, they have a non-traditional student of the year. They have a post-secondary student of the year. They also have a new teacher of the year. And uh, a few years ago, I nominated, uh, at the time, it was Kristen Serrato, now Kristen Marciniak in our criminal justice program, and she won. Now, these are statewide, one winner for the entire state. You might be familiar with the MAVA awards program that we have in April in, in Worcester, where every single school nominates a student, and that student is recognized. So there's 50 students or so uh, across the state. This particular uh, award is one for the entire state. So Kristen won it as the new teacher for the entire state. I think it was the following year I nominated, they have a Friend of CTE award. And uh, I, I nominated Representative Kokop, uh, who had passed away unfortunately, but uh, his, the support he provided us uh, as a school. And he won uh, the, the Friend of the CTE uh, statewide. <clears throat> so this year, uh, talking to the Avon team, I just wanted to share with you the nomination I put forward. Uh, I already shared this with both the police chief, the fire chief, and the mayor. Uh, so they were well aware of it. Both chiefs uh, wrote back to me. They were blown away that we were even thinking of them. Uh, I'm not going to read it. You'll have it. I'll put it in the minutes. But just highlighting uh, what the fire department and what the police department have done for us as a school, i.e. the fire, uh, but also uh, what they've done to support the criminal justice program, uh, automotive program. Uh, it, it's just it's unbelievable to see that, that relationship between uh, the school and, and those two, two departments. So. Just wanted to share with the board, uh, highlighting those those city departments. We'll see if, if they win. We have it. And then finally, uh, the MAPA legislative priorities. Thinking you are the elected board, I just want you to know, uh, statewide, I, I sort of allude to a lot of these things over, over the last several months. Uh, I gave you it's a two-page cheat sheet. I'm, I'm sorry, three-page cheat sheet. There's page three of two. The, the page numbers are wrong. Um, I'm just going to quickly highlight a few of these. This is an ominous, an ominous bill that we are getting um, put forward to the State House. Um, Friday is the deadline for, for submitting bills. We already have representatives and senators who are going to sign off uh, as sponsors. And I just want to give the board kind of a, a 30,000 foot level view of what we're trying to push forward. Section one, we're asking for a lot of money. $3 billion we want from the state uh, to give for vocational technical schools, basically so we can build new schools or expand current schools. That's what we're asking for, $3 billion. Section two uh, is to uh, authorize a local debt exclusion. This would be for, kind of odd for us, it probably won't really pertain to us because we have to fall through the city of Northampton and we know how complicated it is with the governance model. But more of the traditional regional vogue techs, uh, the county ag schools, if, if they have a building project and they're looking at debt, debt exclusion, uh, we have a proposal on the table to try to uh, make that process easier for all of them. Section three, this is back to MSBA. Again, building projects. The idea behind this, we all know that vocational schools cost a lot of money to build. <clears throat> so the proposal here is when the MSBA uh, assigns a reimbursement rate, for a regional vote tech, hypothetically, if that, if that reimbursement rate was 50%, if this passes, we'll automatically jump it up by 20%. So if you were originally um, a lot of 50% reimbursement, it jumps up to 70%. If you were given a 60% reimbursement rate, it jumps up to 80%. That's what we're asking for. I give the local communities uh, a better ability to, to build or rebuild regional vote techs and, and all the other vocational schools in general. That's section three. Section four, <clears throat> this is a hot topic. Uh, this is more of a bargaining chip, to be honest. Uh, there's a lot of they said within MAVA, myself included, uh, on this one, but this is one that we could use as a, bar a bargaining chip that we can give up to get something. And it's to create a new position within the Department of Ed. Uh, it's a new deputy, deputy commissioner. Our main focus would be having that individual pushing hard on the actual regulations, back to access. You know, why can we not get into the middle schools? I have no authority to tell the middle school and that setting district you have to let us in, but if there was somebody from the department forcing that issue, that may allow us to get those doors open. So that's also being proposed. <clears throat> Section five, uh, this would definitely be more pertinent to us, would be expansion grants. 
So there'd be a threshold. If a uh, vocational school has a certain threshold in uh, student enrollment increase, okay, I forget what the threshold was, 2% or something like that, it's relatively small, uh, you'd, we would then be eligible for expansion <coughs> to allow us to expand, uh, to, to accommodate the, the increased capacity and enrollment that we have. So again, it's all about the money. <coughs> Section 6, this is right now, there's no representatives from the, the vocational world that sits on the MSBA board. Uh, so if, if this passes, it gets a member of MAVA, a representative from MAVA, and a representative from ABTE, which is a, another advocacy group out there supporting folk ed. Uh, it would have uh, two additional seats added to their board, one for MAVA, one for ABTE, to again have more people advocating for folk ed within MSBA. Section 7, back to MSBA, okay, the idea is to add another priority within their uh, their equation to figure out who gets the money, who doesn't get the money. Uh, at, adding this line, addressing the demand for Chapter 74 vocational tech programs aligned with labor market needs. So again, the only schools that are able to uh, show the demand and tie it back to ch Chapter 74 programs aligned to the labor market needs are schools that offer Chapter 74 programs, i.e. the VOC schools. So a traditional high school would not be able to address that, so they wouldn't be able to meet that priority, which means they would fall down on the, the back of the list. That's the idea behind that particular section. <clears throat> section 8 is to create a very broad-reaching um, commission to study the funding options for folk schools. And you can see the, the various representation that is being proposed in that particular section. And finally, in Section 9, this goes back to Section 1, which is you know, $3 billion. Okay, uh, where are we advocating for uh, that, that $3 billion? And uh, we're advocating that they come up with a 30-year general obligation bond uh, program to, to fund that $3 billion. So those are the priorities that MAVA is pushing forward. Uh, they'll be at the State House as of Friday. The next two pages are around voices license. The next page, uh, page one of two, you can cross off. This was a meeting I was part of t uh, today, actually. We decided not to go with this particular option. We'll go with the second option, which is on the last page. It's option two. So the latest and greatest on this, this is a hoister's license and trying to get a bill passed to update the regulations to allow uh, students to operate hoisting equipment in a Chapter 74 program. That's our end goal. Um, we also had a meet, so the meeting today was not only uh, MAVA leadership, it was the lobbyists that we've hired, uh, many of you have already met in, in other venues, Anthony. Uh, it was also, uh, FFA has taken this on, uh, and then finally, uh, we, we reached out to the Mass Farm Bureau and their lobbyists as well. So they're all part of this meeting. We've agreed that the Mass Farm Bureau will take this bill. They're going to be the ones to push this bill, get sponsors at the State House to sign off. So it's going to be really their bill, and MAV is going to be pushing it. Uh, I, we do have that meeting last week with Liz Bennett down at Old Colony. Liz Bennett is meeting with the Commissioner of the Office of Professional License. Is that? Yeah, I think it's, yeah, Professional License, this is the Occupational Licensure, but I think it falls under that. <clears throat> so uh, she's meeting with that Commissioner this week. So I do know that we have support at the Department of Ed. We have to have support at the Department of Ed. It's their Chapter 70, it's their programs, it's their regulations. Uh -huh. So she's pushing it from the Educational Agency. Bob has been pushing it, but if we have an actual an uh, industry professional association, which is the Mass Farm Bureau. Uh, so basically the employers of the Commonwealth, uh, they're the ones pushing it, we can support them. We're hoping that would be sort of this two-pronged approach to have more buy-in at the State House. And the proposal here, again, you can read it. In essence, this would allow Chapter 74 programs, students enrolled in Chapter 74 programs to, to operate the hoisting equipment under the direct supervision of an instructor, a Chapter 74 instructor, who holds a current hoisting license. Uh, again, the argument right now that's being used against us is safety, student safety. They're worried about kids getting hurt. Uh, so that is a very difficult public relations battle to have when we as a school, we're also worried about student safety. Uh, so how do we walk that very fine line of we want our students to access this equipment that can be dangerous, but as I already mentioned, we have other programs that use very difficult equipment, dangerous equipment, but because of our standards, we're able to maintain student safety. Um, so we're hoping that we're able to sort of thread that needle. 
uh, to, to show that as a Chapter 74 program, we already have high standards. If, as long as we have a licensed instructor who's directly supervising the students, why not? Um, just as a, an offtake, and these are different challenges that we've been sharing with the state. <clears throat> One is, any of us in this room, we're all over 18, um, after this meeting, you can go to Home Depot, you can rent a small excavator, a small piece of equipment, and you go home and you can tear up your lawn, and you can do whatever you want without a OASIS license. Same agency oversees that. There's already that, that allowance. Another allowance in the regulations is a, uh, an ag exception. So if you own your own private farm, um, your five-year-old child can be operating that tractor on your family farm, no issue. Uh, so we've already tried the ag exception as an ag school. Uh, the, the pushback is this is not our personal farm, uh, so we can't use that. Um, they haven't had a great response back as far as you can go to Home Depot and purchase, you can rent that equipment, but why can't we do this at a school? Uh, they haven't figured that one out. But the big argument that we've been making um, is that we are like the driver's ed model for hoist, hoister's license, uh, that whole educational program. Without Chapter 74, all you have to do is, again, get a DOT physical and take a test. And that test does not ask anything about safe operations of the, of the machine. It's basically regulations around state law around the equipment. It doesn't uh, verify if you can actually truly operate it safely. That's what our students are learning here. Uh, so when they do graduate and they are employed, hopefully they're a safer operator of the equipment. Uh, in essence, it's that driver's ed model. So again, I, I talk about this stuff a lot. I want the board to be aware that at the state level, this is what's going on. Questions about these documents? Oh, that's a good analogy to driver's ed. Would you want it to be 17 like it is if you take driver's ed? Do you think it would be 17? So this agency has come back with a waiver offer. Uh, their offer that we sort of shot down is uh, at 16. 16 in the DOT, they would allow an apprentice license. Uh, the challenge that we push back on is we are a school, and uh, how do you differentiate within a classroom who's 16 and who's not 16? So in reality, what that would look like would be our sophomore class. Um, some sophomores who, are, who turn 16 would be allowed to use the equipment. The other sophomores would not be allowed. So we were pushing back to say sophomore year. So apply a grade level, uh, but they're stuck on that driver's ed model, that driver's license model. The 16-year-old was sort of stuck in their mind, uh, trying to get them away from an age and a, a more a grade level would make more sense. So I think at the end of the day, there may be a compromise. If, right now, we, we have our freshman operating equipment. We may not be allowed to use our, allow our freshmen to use equipment. But if it can be a grade level, as far as the instruction goes, it makes more sense. The DOT physical, um, the problem is most of the uh, medical facilities that are offering the DOT physicals, you have to be 18 for the physical. So even if they allow the waiver at 16, that 16-year-old who's allowed the waiver can't find a DOT physical because they're not 18. There's a loophole that we have to figure out. Uh, we push back, why can't we uh, allow the traditional physical that our student athletes have to go through? Why wouldn't that physical be sufficient? And uh, they're not accepting that. Anyways. Uh, one of the things that, as you were going through all this, that we offer here is the OSHA uh, standards. And I think that just a suggestion to use that along with your whole conversation would give you a lot more clout in regards to the standard people that are taking these tests. Our students are getting that OSHA testing ahead of time for safety. Yeah. Uh, just thought it was yeah. it's, it's amazing. I, I've never seen two state agencies totally 1,000% at odds. Yeah. Uh, and the argument is a fair argument. We're worried about student safety. I, I'm not going to argue that. Uh, but again, you see the grants that the state has given us. And we're only one school. Um, the governor has signed off on all of this equipment to be given to the schools for the student operation. And now another agency that reports to the same governor is saying, no, you can't touch it. Yeah. It didn't. No. Yeah. Oh, thank you for all this information. Um, on the bill that's being filed. I have just a couple questions on um, section four. Um, who creating the Office of Vocational Technical Education under a Deputy Commissioner? So would that person report to Liz Bennett or to Cliff? No. To, to the Commissioner. To the Commissioner. Because it says under a Deputy Commissioner. 
Oh, so it would be a deputy commissioner for vocational technical Important. education. Yeah. Right. So right now, VOCED is part of the CCTE office. It's right. the career and college, well, college and career technical education yeah. office. Um, his recommendation is to pull out the CTE component and have his own office gotcha. uh, separate from them. So um, right now, Cliff is the deputy commissioner and Liz is under him? Sure. Or the, okay. Yeah. So my next question is about um, Section 8, creating a 26-member vocational technical education funding committee to set study funding options. What does that mean? Study what funding options? What funding options are there? Funding options for what? To fund vocational ed. You mean besides Chapter 70 and tuition reimbursement? Correct. Like what? That's what the commission is for. So the idea is Chapter 70, the way the formula works is already set up, I believe, to educate traditional districts. Academic. Academic so, districts. Yeah. Um, how can we modify the funding formula to support the extra cost of VOCED? Because right now that system, even though that system is such a small percentage for us, so it doesn't pertain to us necessarily that much, but a, a traditional regional folk tax who's reliant on that funding formula, they can't, they can't sustain it. So my last question is, um, are our local representatives co-sponsors of this, or will they be? They potentially can be. I don't think they are yet. Um, I'm not sure the, the current status now. I do know I referenced Senator Comerford. I haven't spoken to her yet. Uh, but on the hoisting license with the Mass Farm Bureau, uh, they were asked for any Western Mass representation. So I mentioned uh, her involvement. I, I mentioned both. But we'll see how that plays out. Yep. Uh, no, no donations this month. Uh, looking ahead, I skipped through this really quickly. Uh, basically, this the rest of this month, starting today, we had our department starting with our department head budget meetings. So again, as a reminder, our department heads come forward. They meet with uh, Crystal, Joe, myself, and uh, depending on what side, whether it's vocational or academic. Academic, they meet with Mr. Parks. Vocational, also with uh, Ms. Chartier. And uh, so, a great first meeting today. Uh, the, the next couple of weeks would be budget meetings, basically all day. Uh, so that that process has started. I already mentioned tomorrow will be down in Franklin. Friday is our monthly CEPS <coughs> Collaborative uh, Steering Committee. Uh, that, typically that's all mine. And then uh, next week, this is another highlight of the year. On Tuesday, the 24th, I'll be traveling down to Devons uh, as a MAVA officer, and we're talking to the new cohort of Leadership One. Uh, so Leadership One is typically uh, your current teachers who have aspirations to move into leadership. Uh, they go through Leadership One. In that first session, we just sort of talk about, uh, hey, what, who is MAVA, uh, who are we? But more importantly, just talking about leadership within our schools and what that, what that looks like to really kind of motivate uh, the teachers as, as they begin the process. So that's next week. Also another uh, great step forward, uh, next Tuesday, that same day I'll come back, and then later on, on the 30th, we have our first two dates locked in for unit negotiations. Next Wednesday morning, we have our next general advisory meeting, uh, starting at 7 o'clock in the cafeteria with the new floor. Uh, that same uh, afternoon, I have a, a model board of directors meeting. February 3rd is the monthly luncheon for the Connecticut Valley Superintendent's Roundtable. On uh, February 9th is the next city department head meeting. So again, I think last month I mentioned uh, the first one that we had with the new mayor. Uh, this will be the second one I attended. And then um, on February 13th, this was another communication today. I think I, I mentioned this back in the fall, uh, but the department is trying to increase their communication with the various schools uh, all across the state. Uh, this is a new initiative that they're trying to start this year, and it's, a, it's regional superintendent meetings, but it's not regional superintendents. It's regional in the state, okay? They break down the state, and then they invite all the superintendents in that particular region who offer some level of CTE uh, to a meeting, and it's like a sounding board, so we can share with the department what's going on in our particular region. We can listen to them and their initiatives. So uh, they broke the state down into all different regions. Uh, this particular one is the Franklin County, Hampshire County. Uh, I saw the email today. There's three superintendents that were invited, myself, Franklin County, and South Hadley. Uh, so there's only three. And they're asking for a host. So I, I volunteered uh, Smith Oak Oak to be the host. We'll see what happens. Uh, so that meeting is on February 13th. And then, uh, as most of you know, our next board meeting is the 14th. I believe that might be it. Well, so on February 13th, 
Uh, I do want to talk, continue to talk about next steps for the horticulture building. Hopefully by that point we have more information around an OPM uh, and potential going out to bid on the, uh, the design uh, phase of the, the project. And uh, I also want to sort of preview with the board the FY24 budget priorities. Uh, what you're going to see from me probably come the, the March meeting, uh, the official budget will be uh, on, on the doorstep. And with that, I'll turn it back to the chair. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. <coughs> Uh, good evening again. Uh, just quickly, our student reps couldn't be with us tonight, uh, but Andy did email some information uh, she asked me to share. Uh, just some fundraisers are going on. Athletics, girls and boys, basketball, did a shop cloth sale. Athletes and members of the school community uh, can go to the gear shop and support those teams. Viking Runestone has began its advertising campaign. The students and staff are looking to sell advertisements to help publish the Spring 23 edition. Uh, in the library, Ms. Gans Hotchett is teaching Strand 6 technology to newly placed freshmen along with the shop instructors. And uh, Mr. Mendelson, our Spanish teacher, has gone into criminal justice uh, where he's doing some Spanish workshops with them around terminology. Uh, and our art and health classes are beginning to switch as that semester is coming to an end. Currently at 563 students, you can see the application uh, rate year over year. <clears throat> We're at 206 applications. Um, so if you look at that, pretty high um, where we are at compared to um, last year at this time. Last year we were at 172. This year, 206, 44 from Northampton, 21.4 percent. And you see, it, if you look back all the way to 2018, uh, where we were at 139, uh, wasn't quite the low. Our low was 129 in January of 2021, not surprisingly. Um, and now we're at, at our high of 206. School Council, we're in process of updating the student handbook. We completed Spirit Week, which we did. When we got back from. The, Jan uh, the, the December break. So that was January 3rd through 6th. Some of the themes that the students created this year was Country vs. Country Club, Dress Up, Dress Down, and Color Wars. Uh, we also held our annual dodgeball tournament on Friday the 6th, and we're happy to say that this year's winner was the staff team, which is the first time during my tenure here the staff have won. Uh, and student government usually does a second spirit week in March, which they'll be planning again. Personnel side, we posted for an electrical instructor due to a resignation. We had Chris Kelly, who uh, went to Holyoke for to Dean Tech as their vocational director. And we posted for the third animal instructor, uh, animal science instructor, which was in our budget last year. If you recall, that was a mid-year hire uh, to help write the curriculum for the companion animal concentration. So pending your questions, brief report. Thank you very much, sir. Would you address the country or country club? <laughs> uh, I guess country club, because I wore what I normally do. <laughs> so, uh, congratulations on the applications. Yeah, definitely. It's very exciting. Do you exciting. think the sign's helping? <clears throat> the new sign? I can't hurt. That's a beautiful yeah, sign. Uh, and it's, it's up there. Apply now. Apply now. Apply now. So I noticed it. Hopefully yeah. it's helping. <laughs> uh, so the business report is in your packet uh, for reference. Um, and uh, we went through facilities. Tim, anything else? No, nope. covered it pretty okay. good. So. Under new business, may I have a motion and a second to approve to support the MASC MASS letter to Governor Healy? Second. second. With a correction. We have the date wrong. <laughs> good catch. <laughs> It jumped right out at me right there. <laughs> Anyways, okay. move on. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. We have a motion to second to approve the following surplus for resale from pre-engineering a MakerBot replicator, a 3D printer, and a new Tufts Smart Extruder 
The incoming cone air, it's a small, deep, fat fryer. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? No. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman, before you move Please. on, Please. I have a procedural question. Um, I'd like to get on the radar, starting to start conversation regarding a Smith Vocational Agricultural High School capital campaign. Mm -hmm. Do we get that on next month's agenda, or I'd like to get the conversation going, um, reach out to alumni, create a master list, uh, however, you know, send out mailings. I, I feel, my opinion, we need to do something to reach out to our alumni and families in that and see if we can raise money internally. Well, what I'd recommend is that at our agenda setting meeting, we'll get that on the agenda and then okay. we can uh, have a discussion. Thank you. You're welcome. So future business, February 14th, our regular Board of Trustees meeting, 5 o'clock here in the library. March 21st, regular Board of Trustees meeting, 5 to 7 in the library. And April 7th, uh, regular Board of Trustees meeting. May have a motion a second to adjourn. You said April 7th? April 11th. 11th, sorry. So moved. So moved. Second. Second. Well, whatever. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody.